Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Zivid webinar. Uh, today, the subject is achieve optimal hand-eye calibration for enhanced robotics performance. So this is uh, a subject that is very important for us here at Zivid. Uh, hand-eye calibration can be very tricky. Uh, whether you're like very experienced in robotics and free division or you're just starting. So we just wanted to have this little chat with you guys to give you some tips and tricks about, about hand-eye calibration and what is the best uh, method uh, from our point of view. Um, and for this um, webinar, uh, we'll have Amy, who's an engineer here at Zivit. And we also have um, uh, someone from uh, Samuel uh, uh, Bernard uh, from uh, Robotique. Samuel Bertrand, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Samuel Bertrand from Robotique, uh, who will uh, give us his insights uh, as we are using Robotique uh, for a robot simulator uh, to perform hand eye calibration. So I'm going to start and share with you guys a video that we have um, recorded a few days ago uh, because we have a lot of uh, robots moving and stuff to show you. And this is all in our demo room, so I can't show you here now. Uh, so I will do that now. And uh, after that, uh, we'll have a little presentation and a Q&A with uh, our two speakers. And at the end, you will be able to um, ask your own questions uh, to the speakers. Uh, one important thing to note here is that uh, you can ask all your questions in the questions panel here on the right of your screen. So we will answer live. And at the end of the webinar, uh, Robotica will choose uh, three winners uh, who will win um, a six months license for RoboDK. So we'll have a, a poll at the end and you can say if you are interested or not and uh, RoboDK will pick randomly three people uh, at the end of the webinar. So something to not miss if you are interested. Okay, let's start now. Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about hand-eye calibration and the tools we have supported here at Zivid. If you work in fields with robotics, machine vision, or computer vision, you know that having a good hand-eye transformation between your camera and your robot is extremely crucial to the accuracy of your system. So what we're going to do today is discuss hand-eye and how to get the best results, but before we go into that, let's take a dive into what hand-eye is. Hand-eye calibration is the transformation between your robot and your camera. And there's two ways to look at this. You have your eye to hand and your eye in hand for your system. Your eye to hand is when your camera is mounted stationary to your robot. So it's going to be mounted separate from where your robot is. Your eye in hand is when your camera is mounted directly on your robot, usually on the last joint at the end effector of the robot. Uh, the Zivid hand eye is able to solve for both of these situations. Zivid hand eye calibration is agnostic to the type of robot in your system. All you need to do is provide the poses in a 4x4 homogeneous matrix and the corresponding point clouds. With this data, Zivit is able to return a rigid transformation to give you the relationship between your camera and your robot. We will look at different steps we recommend to guarantee the best hand-eye calibration. Whether you're a seasoned expert with hand-eye or you're just getting started with using hand-eye calibration, we hope to offer some tips and tricks that help provide valuable insights and information about hand-eye calibration and how important we consider the topic here at Zivit. For this webinar, we're going to be using the Zivid calibration target, along with the help of RoboDK to help us automate the poses to be able to complete a hand-eye calibration with our UR5. And at the end of this webinar, we will have the pleasure of welcoming Samuel from RoboDK for a public Q&A. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. The first step we want to do is to do a warm-up with our camera. This makes sure you get the most accurate hand-eye transformation result, starting with a good warm-up period. The camera should be at the expected temperature of operation that you want to maintain while the cell is working. Zivit is a high accuracy imaging device, and to achieve optimal performance, it's necessary to warm it up to a stable operating state. The glass in the lens can expand or contract, as can the metal components within the camera. A warm-up period gives these components some time to stabilize, improving your accuracy and overall performance of your camera. 
In our example, we use the camera on live mode to rapidly increase the internal temperature of the camera. Once we believe the camera is up to the operating state we expect, we're able to go ahead and start with our infield correction. The calibration target we feature in our scenes is one we have specially designed here at Zivid, but there are a lot of other calibration targets out there. Some of the notable ones are the printed checkerboards you can use for OpenCV. There are also the Halcone circle boards, which are unique for their orientations, and then the spheres are often commonly used for doing infield calibration. Another cool example is that you can also use unique 3D items or objects that have different patterns on each side or different textures so that from each angle they present a unique perspective. In this case you actually see that there is a triangle covered in different uh, types of fiducial markers. Now if we take a look at the Zivet calibration target, we have designed it to be robust with a high level planarity as well as a high trust in the shape and size of our checkers. Each checker is 30 centimeters across and we have verified that the variance you see in our checkers is within the noise floor of the camera. This is what allows us to use our checkerboards for infield correction as well as hand-eye calibration. In our newest SDK release 2.9, we have a GUI now available in Zivit Studio for doing infield verification. For this example, I'm going to go ahead and use it here so I can have a, more of an interface to show you guys how this works. I was able to get the help of Softia using new SDK 2.9 to show how our infield correction tool works. We're able to put the board at different distances from our camera to verify the quality of our camera and the dimension accuracy. If you move the checkerboard around in the field of view at the same distance, you're also able to get a better data set for the correction at that distance as well. If we take a closer look at what the GUI provides, you'll see that we have a capture and measure button at the top. This is going to capture the image in front of your camera that you're going to be able to see displayed in the Zivid SDK. This image is then going to be used to first verify your camera and see what the current dimension trueness is of your scene. And then afterwards, it will save it into a data set, which you can then use to add another infield correction to your camera. So you have two choices here. You can either just verify using the images you just took, or you can use save and correct to your camera so that you're able to apply a correction to your camera from the data set you just acquired. Once you have saved this correction to your camera, it will be used for the point clouds you take afterwards. There's no way to disable this. The only way to remove your infield correction is to either replace it with a new infield correction or to remove any infield correction from your camera and only use a factory calibration. You can reference the infield correction articles that we have on the knowledge base if you want to learn more about doing the best infield correction for your camera at your workspace. And that's it for infield correction. Once you have it applied to your camera, you're good to go. There's no other interference from the user's part to be able to use this going forward. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the handout tutorial that Tiago made. Using RoboDK, we've been able to automate the process of making poses and saving them so we were able to repeat our hand-eye calibrations. Again, to be able to test different SDKs or different environments. So it's been a super handy tool for us and we've been able to test this using both eye on hand and eye in hand solutions. We recommend when you do a hand-eye calibration to capture the board from different pose angles. These pose angles provide a way to make sure you're exercising the joints of the robot so that you're able to see the board from different positions and then also know that all the joints are getting some movement. This helps decrease the amount of robot error that you're going to see in your final hand-eye transformation. At this point, you can see Tiago making poses for an eye and hand solution for our system. He's able to use the SDK in live so that he's able to figure out where the board is in the field of view of the camera and then save the poses that correspond to that field of view using RoboDK. With these two tools together, you're able to build a robust data set and also see your total coverage of your working area. It's a really helpful tool and also helps us evaluate if customers have gotten full coverage on their systems as well if they're able to send us poses from their cell. So we've had customers be able to send us um, examples of the setup they've done in the past and we're able to replicate them just using the simulations to see if all the poses look accurate for finding a hand-eye solution. Once you have finished acquiring and saving all your poses in your RoboDK file, you're able to then fully automate the system of acquiring your hand-eye poses along with your ZDFs. This system runs just using the Python script that we provide online. The only other input you need is to be able to tell it if you want an eye in hand transformation or an eye to hand transformation. 
You can see both of those examples shown here in our video, where we do one example that shows the eye in hand where we capture the board, and you can see the mirror robot in RoboDK. And then afterwards, you'll see an eye in hand, eye to hand solution, rather, where you'll then see how we do the same using RoboDK. So as we watch the camera perform eye-to-hand calibration, I just want to point out the environment we're using for RoboDK is a bit sparse. You can actually add your entire environment into the scene so that you have a full environment actually simulated as well and not just your robot. This can be really nice to use for collision checking if you know the position of the objects in your scene. And also gives you a chance to add different path planning and waypoints if you have a more complex motion you expect your robot to complete. Another cool thing is you're also able to add other end effectors, so you could take a model of our checkerboard and attach it to the robot if you want to use that as part of your collision checks as well. For this case though, we kept it rather simple, and as you can see, we just have our robot going through the poses, so we're able to capture this for the infield correction. The main interface we use here is through Python, and you can find that code sample on our GitHub like we discussed earlier. So a lot of what's going on is actually behind the scenes or kind of under the hood in this case. At the same time that the robot is running, and you can see the simulation in RoboDK, on the side panel in your terminal, you're going to be able to see that each capture you make should be a valid pose. If the return does not show up, then it's not going to show that it is valid. So we will actually see the program is going to stop if the poses you chose don't work for hand-eye. Uh, in this case, all our poses are within the camera's viewpoint, and we're able to accurately detect the checkerboard. Once you finish gathering the poses and the ZDFs for the hand-eye calibration, we'll then run them through our algorithm to find the best overall transformation that overlaps all the checkerboard images that you got with the pose information we have. The overlapping of these is going to give you your residuals, which will tell you the difference in overlap with rotational and translational elements. And this is really nice, but you still kind of want to know, how well does this actually work? And to provide this information, we have created a touch test that's also available on our GitHub. This touch test allows you to see, using your TCP, if the hand-eye transformation that we provided works in your system. In our example here, you'll see how we use an eye-on-hand camera system to do touch tests using the checkerboard we were looking at earlier. We then move the checkerboard around the scene so it's not in the same position that we did our hand-eye calibration in because we want to test that our hand-eye calibration is valid in all of our working space at different translational positions as well as different rotational orientations. Uh, it's not really helpful usually, right, if your hand-eye transformation is invalid across the whole scene. If it's only valid in the place you took your hand-eye calibration, then there is a risk that it might not be good for your entire working space. It's important to be aware a robot system can have inaccuracies due to a variety of issues. This can be due to mechanical inaccuracies, sensor inaccuracies, calibration inaccuracies, control inaccuracies, environmental factors. There's lots of different things to consider when you're testing your hand-eye calibration. This is why throughout this process we've discussed that you should be doing your warm-up period and an infield correction to make sure that your camera can be trusted throughout the entire process. So our goal here is to minimize the risk of your camera contributing to the inaccuracies of your system so that when we calibrate it, we can show reliable and accurate performance. If you check out our chat, you're going to see that we've dropped a few links on this topic. We have some links to our samples that we discussed today that are on our GitHub. And then we also have a few links to our knowledge base at support.civit.com that show how we solve the hand-eye problem and the different samples we have available for hand-eye. So now let's move over to a Q&A with Samuel from RoboDK, where we're going to discuss a bit more about hand-eye calibration and the best way to get an accurate hand-eye calibration for your system. Yes, so the 
video is over now. Thank you, Amy. Uh, so like I said, we uh, recorded this video a few days ago uh, so that we could show you uh, also the robot moving and what is actually hand-eye calibration and touch tests uh, in uh, real life. Um, so now we're going to go to a discussion uh, between uh, Amy and uh, Sam from Robotica, and uh, they will just have a formal, informal talk about uh, the subject. And after that, you will be able to ask all your questions and we'll answer your questions. Hello, everyone. Hello. All right. Nice. 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 <laughs> Not sure how are you how are you guys i think okay. amy i i can hear you in the some echoes yeah i'm not sure why is that better or it's good though yeah it's good okay <laughs> i'll take it <laughs> but yeah so uh yeah so we recorded the video a couple days ago and it, I realized that like we really covered hand-eye from the camera perspective and what we can do at Zivid to make the camera one of the more stable parts of the system. So I guess what I wanted to see is from the perspective of RoboDK and from your perspective, Sam, is what factors are, do you think are the most important to get a good hand-eye transfer or transformation uh, rather? Yeah, so uh, one thing to keep in mind is that you could have a true camera system, a person system, you would still rely on the accuracy of your robot. And uh, that accuracy uh, ranges depending on where, what joints are involved, uh, where the center of gravity is. So if you have a payload and you're near the base or far stretch, it shifts the, the center of gravity. So um, you really need to take that into account when you perform your end eye calibration. If you're really looking for the, you know, the the some millimeter, if you really are in, into accuracy, some applications don't require that. So if you have a vacuum gripper with some level of compliance and you're trying to pick fairly large objects and put them on a conveyor without too much regards to accuracy, most likely you'll perform everything uh, in the tutorial and uh, you'll be good to go. Uh, but if you're really trying to find some edges and perform some correction with uh, with a, let's say cladding or a welding something that needs precision uh, mm. you want to pay attention to those small details so try to perform your end eye at the actual workspace where you will need that accuracy um, if you have a tool you haven't received it yet from your company wait until you have it put it on place and ensure you have the payload that, that represents your application. Um, those can also um, have a small impact on your end eye calibration. Yeah, this is something that we've also done for when helping customers with hand eye is that we had a customer with a very large system and a robot that could stretch like two and a half meters. And he would see that at the close working space, he would have no problem with performing the task, but the farther away he got, there's to be more drag or more like load or movement in the robot because yep. it was stretched out so far. So even if you have a good hand-eye transformation and the rigid uh, relationship between the camera and the robot is an accurate transform, as you said, there still could be the risk that your hand-eye could work in one space, but not the other. So one option that we told him is you could in theory do two hand-eye calibrations, one for each kind of working space. So would that be something you think would be viable as well? Yeah, that would be viable. Uh, also, maybe try to, so there's some range with the robot joints and try to, let's say, have a wide range or a range that represents your application and what you'll be uh, using your robot. Um, mm -hmm. The other option is robot calibration. So robot calibration can be performed when you buy uh, your robot as an option by the manufacturer. Some offers that, uh, some don't. Uh, if that's the case, you can uh, use cal robot calibration as a service or even something like RoboDK. We have a separate license for robot calibration. So using a 3D or 6D measurement system, you're able to mm -hmm. calibrate your robots and have accurate kinematics. So when you perform your AI calibration, you uh, have a more accurate representation of the pose of the robot, which you yeah. then use for your AI. Very cool. Yeah, so a lot that we can do to hopefully minimize errors in the system. So there's so many pieces in the puzzle. So uh, yeah, so I guess we kind of already touched on 
that Zivic hammer could be used to perform this robot calibration as well. So, and then. Yeah, one case, thing to note is that we could even use the uh, Zivit camera to both perform the anti calibration, but also perform the robot calibration. So mm -hmm. it could be like a, with one in a one perception device, you would get both the anti and the robot calibration at the same time. Yeah. So yeah, this gives a lot of opportunities, or maybe uh, let's say cost efficient or hardware efficient way to be able to not just calibrate your camera to your robot, but also verify that your robot is well calibrated for the task at hand as well. Correct. So then it kind of comes on to the next piece of the puzzle because we have multiple, I would say, building blocks to performing this task. So then, then we can say that we have the camera for the eyes, we have the robot for the movement in the arms, but then you kind of have, let's say, the hands or the TCP of the robot as yeah. well. So how difficult do you find calibrating the TCP is? Um, do you guys have some sort of software as well, if I remember correctly, to perform TCP yeah, calibration? So the, the traditional way of without RoboDK would be to perform it through your teach pendant, where you record a series of points at different angles to get a representation, uh, a representation of where your TCP is. Uh, that's usually like four or six points. Um, and RoboDK provides a way to perform that through RoboDK and get, let's say, statistics representing uh, if you have uh, the typical errors, you're able to, to get and maybe eliminate points that are not mm -hmm. representative of your TCP. Um, we also provide a a tool called uh, Twin Tool, RoboDK Twin Tool, where you can automate that process with an external device. And so if you have a very good NI calibration and you have a very accurate robot, your ability to perform the um, tool center point definition is yeah. also, will also dictate how accurate you are able to perform your tasks. So for instance, um, if you are recording a four points method to calibrate your tool and you're you don't pay attention to how close you can get and you're jogging with the teach pendant and you have yeah. fairly large errors, then you might end up doing a touch test and have an inaccurate results and wonder mm -hmm. who, who's at fault. And it might simply be your TCP, which is not defined correctly. Yeah, so one of the goals that we always try to aim for here is to remove the human error aspect, right? Because a lot of what we do ends up being kind of an eyeballing estimate. So the more we can really rely on some empirical data and actual measurement data, the better results we get long run and the more robust we can trust our systems to be. So right. it's really nice to be able to have all these tools that come together so you can individually test and verify all of these components are going to be valid and work for your system or your scene. Yeah, so those are the three main questions I had. And I think we kind of have, or at least we covered a pretty good overview of the different pieces that can create a poor hand-eye calibration and what you should be looking out for when you are performing those hand-eye calibrations as well to make sure that you get the most accurate one for your scene and that it can meet the standards required for the uh, trueness. So basically, how much air do you have? How much tolerance does your system allow? Um, because we know that different TCPs are going to require different air requirements. So between all these aspects, hopefully that gave a good overview and we could look at a couple of questions from the audience and see what other topics we should go for. So let's see, what do we have? Hello again. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, before we go to the q and I just uh, wanted to ask myself a question to the audience. Uh, you can answer in the chat, uh, just a very general question. What is the most difficult aspect of uh, hand-eye calibration for you guys? You can answer in the chat. <laughs> TCP calibration, says uh, Jose. Some more people typing. Mark says accuracy outside calibration area. TCP calibration accuracy for Sergey. For Maxim robot calibration, because it's using some huge robot. Okay, can you maybe do you want to maybe talk about this? Uh, like, what is it to do calibration with a huge robot, uh, uh, Sam? Uh, 
Wait, well, it was well uh, explained by Amy just before. If you have a large robot, you typically have a lot of stress when you extend that robot or with the payload that you carry, um, that wear and tear that involves by carrying those uh, uh, kind of payload. And so, um, you as said, as you said, the accuracy of the input device is usually much better than what the robot is is capable of as in terms of accuracy and so having a recalibrated robot for sure will have both define the end but also make your application works and uh, um, depending on the accuracy that you need and i see a lot of questions regarding to tcp calibration and so you have an automated process to to define your your i location and then you rely on the manual approach to define your tcp and that's where the sources ever uh, or usually comes in. And so I'm not suggesting to use Rebooty K, but if you were to use Rebooty K, you can define it with more points and you can also pinpoint which points are the most um, true so that you get a more reliable TCP calibration if you don't go with another mated approach. I also wanted to comment on a message that John Howard generating the robot poses. So that was one reason that we started using RoboDK here at Zivit is because we found that having that GUI interface allowed us to kind of get a mapping of how our poses look to make sure we got full coverage of our working space. So it was really nice to be able to use that to make sure we got a quality hand-eye calibration or help us determine if we got a quality hand-eye calibration. Another nice part about using RoboDK is once we got a data set from a customer who maybe their um, hand-eye calibration was coming out poorly, we were able to then load those poses into RoboDK and verify that they all made sense. Maybe there was a typo somewhere, maybe there was a mistranslation in the rotational elements because different robot vendors use different methodology to find the rotational element if you use like XYZ in a roll pitch y'all um, writing format. So like Kuga uses a different one than I think ABB and like UR, like they all have their own method of which rotations they consider first when you're looking yeah. at the robot. So using RoboDK gave us a really nice way to troubleshoot this, especially because at Zivid, we use a four by four uh, homogeneous matrix for our output. So that is kind of independent of these elements. So then if they do the wrong conversion when converting into that four by four, then there could be errors. So loading these back into RoboDK where we know we use the right rotational elements to get the actual robot poses has been a really great way to help us troubleshoot if these um, poses can result in a good hand eye or make sense that they're all looking, let's say, in the same direction when you're doing your calibration. Yep. And it also makes abstraction of which robot you use because with Robot yes. K with the drivers, uh, you you can essentially uh, swap robots and um, from different brands and it will still use the same code uh, behind to perform your hand eye. You're using uh, the Python API in this case, but yeah. it really shows like uh, the true, let's say, What's great about Roboti K is that we make abstraction of the robot. Um, if you change robot, you might know don't know how to program it, uh, how to use their teach pendant, how to jog the robot. You can all do that in Roboti K, whatever the robot is. So if you're an integrator with the various brands, um, it, you you can build your skills in Roboti K for a wider range of robots instead of learning each individual robots. Yeah. And that's sometimes that's something I've also done here is now as more people join Zivid and we're teaching them how to use, we have a UR5. We also have Yaskawa H10. And it's way easier to explain to somebody how to use Robot Decay once that it works across both robots than it is to teach two people two extremely different teach pendants for the robots. Where UR has this like very graphical interface that's basically a tablet. The Yaskawa robot we had has this like really old school pendant with like tons of buttons and like hand holding and it's just definitely a very more very much more friendly and user good user experience to um use robot dk in that case yeah one other example there's somebody who said that he has a really large robot moving them around uh it's not the same as the, it there's security involved you want to make sure it's safe so with robot you can preview that um and make sure that what you're trying to achieve is reachable and doesn't have collision and stuff like that and so on that it is a safe to go so uh it, it, it adds a layer everything that was described today with the anti calibration can be done without robot k just by retrieving everything from your teach pendant robot k just acts as a an easier approach and a more generic approach yeah i think yeah that's a good way to say it it's uh 
definitely takes down the like threshold to get running faster. So it's like a great way to kind of ease up your integration and really get into faster development. Yes, uh, thank you guys for uh, explaining this uh, some more. Uh, so now we're going to go to the audience Q&A. Um, just before we start, uh, I have dropped some links in the chat uh, right now. So uh, some more uh, links from our knowledge base at Civit and also from RoboDK documentation, uh, especially about uh, the one that everybody was asking about uh, how to calibrate the TCP. So feel free to have a look and uh, go a bit more further with uh, hand-eye calibration. And right now I'm going to also drop a link for um, our uh, latest SDK, SDK 2.9. Uh, so uh, Zivid SDK 2.9 is going to be available uh in a few weeks but now for now we have a preview that you can test yourself uh so it's actually super nice uh, you have we have a lot of new features and improvements uh, like the um, infield correction uh, GUI for example so I'm just dropping the link now and of course you can download uh, the software for free here it is Yes, so now let's go to the questions. So many, many questions here. Very nice. That's a great um, questions. Yeah. Um, let's see. We have an answer from Antonio Gambale. Can you use the Zivit software with Intel RealSense cameras? And are there open source alternatives? Um, interesting question. No, you cannot use the Zivit software with Intel RealSense. That is a very different camera. Zivit software is specifically made for the Zivit cameras. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, yeah. If there is open source alternatives, I do not know them. Yes, exactly. And uh, it's very personal opinion, but I, I would not recommend. I would recommend using Zivit cameras. <laughs> Yeah, and another side note, just if you're using Intel RealSense, um, depending on which ones you're using, they're not always industrial grade cameras. And they're also stereo vision, which is not going to have the level of precision you will see with Zivid cameras. So that is a big reason I would not recommend using them, depending, I guess, on your task. Exactly. Uh, next question. Uh, we are more and more to use 3D cameras. Is it better to use a 3D calibration target or 2D target in that case? I would always recommend using a 3D calibration target. So even though it appears that our uh, calibration targets are 2D, we do use a 3D positioning of the board and the orientation of that board as part of our data. So we're not just using the 2D information of the checkerboard. We're, gener we're using the 2D information to find the different corner points. And then from there, we use some sub-pixel interpolation to find the actual 3D positioning of those data points on the board. So if you're using 2D and 3D, you're always getting more data. So kind of more bang for your buck, if you will, when you're using a target that has both types of data. Nice. Um, I think I saw a question for RoboDK. Is it important to collect RoboDK directly to the robot or it's possible to pass the target to the robot offline? Yeah, so um, the way that Zivid has uh, made a tutorial it, it is using the driver, but if they can also, I don't think is that's been done yet, but we can, the, both options are viable. So there's a way to synchronize the robot with an offline program. So what it means by that is generating the robot code. In the case of a UART, it would be a, a body script file or a URP file, put that into the controller and report or record the targets um, as you perform them. And then uh, do the end eye calibration. That's feasible. I don't think the tutorial that uh, Amy has done is is, is yeah. geared towards that, but it's totally feasible. Yeah. So for our case, we wrote Python scripts and interfaced with um, RoboDK. So instead of trying to interface directly to the robot, we went to RoboDK, but we did store all of our targets in RoboDK as well and use that for any target generation. So we kind of did, I'm not sure, I guess we're hybrid. Don't know. Yeah, yeah, a bit of a hybrid. So with RoboDK, yeah. you could take those targets and generate a program. You just click all of them and you generate a program. You right click it, you can do uh, post uh, generate robot program, put that in the robot controller, 
and uh, just you just have a, a way to sync your captures with the robot, uh, but um, it, it's still totally feasible. Yeah. All right, maybe we can just talk about this later then. I can get some uh, tips and tricks <laughs> on how to make this a bit better of a RoboDK tutorial as well. Perfect. Okay, now we have a um, very uh, free division specific question, I think. What is your recommendation for exposure settings for calibration? More specifically, should one make all the captures with the same settings or let the exposure change from capture to capture? Uh, so usually I would, at least I'm going to assume that the lighting conditions when you perform hand-eye are consistent. So I would use the same settings during the whole capture process. What I would recommend is to use uh, capture assistant to find these settings, but also implement the Gaussian smoothing that we have in our software. So that really smooths out the plane and makes sure that you don't suffer from contrast distortion because checkerboards inherently are two very high contrast materials usually. So you want to use high Gaussian smoothing on your checkerboard to make sure it represents the true plane of the board. And then I would recommend just using capture assistant that we provide so that it will help you find the best settings and use that set of settings you find on the first capture across all the boards in your scene or all the captures of the board in your scene. Great. Um, I'm guessing this is maybe a question for Sam. Uh, Mohamed was asking, the robot must be calibrated before per performing hand-eye calibration? Question mark? Uh, it's optional, but if you have to, if you have a calibrated robot or intend to calibrate your robot, do it before you perform the hand-eye calibration, but you, you can perform hand-eye calibration without robot calibration. Great. Um, more, more, more. Yes. Ah, our favorite subject, Amy. How uh, is the dimension trueness dimension trueness calculated? Uh, that is a heavy question that we have written a few white papers on at this point. Um, <laughs> dimension trueness is where actually, if you take infield correction, for example, in the checkerboard. We have measured that our checkerboards, all the squares, are 30 centimeter, 30 millimeters by 30 millimeters. And then we actually look at them in the field of view and at the distance they're at and verify that they are true to size. And that's what we are using to return a dimension trueness calculation when you do infield correction. So this is an X, Y, and Z that we consider dimension trueness. I know a number of cameras will basically give a Z distance when referring to this, but we consider all dimensions equally important, if you will. So dimension trueness here, when we say we have zero, one or zero point, to 0.1 percent dimension trueness error so we expect that your object should be 99.9 .9 percent true to size across the working distance we give in our data sheet to be fair we sometimes we will possibly get that outside of our working distance but we specifically do calibrate to the working distance we give yes and uh on this note i'm gonna share in the chat uh, a link to our white paper about trueness uh, if you are curious to know what it is it's a very important metric um, um, <clears throat> in free division and definitely um, an obsession at Zibid. Um, we're so obsessed that we uh, have written a 60 pages long <laughs> white paper. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, very technical. So I'm going to share it here. So usually this kind of white paper, uh, we have like a gate on our website and people need to give us uh, their information, but I'm giving it uh, here, the PDF directly. So you don't have to give us your information again. Okay, more questions. Uh, from Aman, can seventh axis um, be added into RoboDK? Um so there's two types of seven axis. There are seven axis robots. We often you uh, see uh, collaborative robots that are seven axis. Uh, we have some in our library already, uh, and we also have external axis. So you could have your robot, which is six axis, with an external uh, axis like a linear rail or a turntable, and we are able to synchronize those. So uh, the that can also be done in RoboDK at the moment. If you have a seven axis robot that's not currently in our library, just ping us and uh, we'll, we'll see if we can make that happen. Great. 
Uh, could we get a link of this seminar recording? Yes, uh, Helen. So uh, at the end of the webinar, you'll get uh, an email uh, right away with the replay of the webinar. So it will be available to everybody. Um, what else? I saw something interesting. Yes. Uh, will Zivit be included into RoboDK library with the option to use the camera views, including point clouds? Uh, I can answer that one. Amy, feel free to to give feedback on that. But uh, if we have the 3D models, we'll, we can add them into our um, online library. So you'll be able to download the Zivid 3D model and put that into your uh, uh, robot with, uh, um, let's say, a guess of where the eye could be. Uh, we can also have sample station. So if we go to robotdk.com, you can go to resources and library you'll find the robots, the tools, such as the cameras and example stations. Currently, we don't hold the uh, sample station that Zivit have prepared, but uh, if we build a nice sales with that, uh, we could we could add it for sure. Yeah, so we have sent over some tools to RoboDK, so that includes two different types of mount that meet different ISO standards that can fit across a couple of different robot models. Um, and we also sent over models of our Zivit 2 camera. So you can use those as well as if you go to support.zivid.com, you will see that we have downloads for our cameras, including the field of view cones, which you can then import into RoboDK and use those to simulate the coverage and field of view of your system. So all of this is available. They come in both step and STL files. I think Linux only accepts one of those styles and Windows accepts both. And I can't remember which ones those are, but we should have full coverage no matter what operating system you should be able to use any models we provide on our knowledge base in the RoboDK data simulator. Have done all this myself, so I can verify it works. Uh, next, Massimo uh, is asking um, what may be the best approach to have accurate hand eye for a robot with heavy payload, and for which is it not feasible to perform calibration directly in the working area? That's an interesting question. Uh, um, <laughs> so usually if you know you'll have a heavy payload, I guess Sam might have a better answer than I do, but I would say you want to mimic the payload you would expect to have while the camera is capturing. So you would right. have the accurate locations. Um, but, but typically you make the captures without the payload. Yeah. So let's say you're carrying a, a big objects, you usually make a capture before taking them. So. Uh, in that case, you would you would not need to carry those objects or that payload. But definitely, if you have uh, let's say a large uh, carrying system that's mounted on the robot or a dress pack, you for sure want to have that when you perform the end eye. Uh, as for the workspace, um, you can usually get the range of the joints close to where you. Um, uh, will be uh, using your or, or capturing. So you can try to work with the range of the robot joints um, and, and observe experimentally if that is actually sufficient for your application. Great. The other solution uh, is robot calibration. So uh, <laughs> if you prefer a robot calibration, you should get more accurate overall uh, representation of your robot and limit the uh, the errors that you might perceive by calibrating in another workspace than your application. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, another question for Marco, for an application in which the robot is doing a set of acquisitions in two specific areas, very different one from the other when it comes to robot joint values, do you suggest to do two separate hand eye calibrations to achieve best precision in each area? Whew. That was a long question. We've done a bit of testing on this, but we've done testing where we look down orientation and also do a testing with facing forward and test using the hand-eye calibration of both. Um, so I, I would say this really depends on the precision abilities of your robot. And then again, as Sam said before, this kind of comes back to robot calibration once again, I would say. Yeah, uh, it's it's experimentally and never compare both like the, the calibration on two different workspaces and compare the actual accuracy uh, that you would get from one and the other. Uh, it's feasible. It's something that you can actually very easily test. You just define two different uh, matrices for each and uh, and you, you get the, the uh, representation of the tool with regards to that. So um, I would suggest 
again, if you try, if you're really looking for accuracy, maybe your application doesn't require as much accuracy as you think. But if your application does require accuracy, you for sure you want to take a look at something like robot calibration. Yeah, so I think that's a really good point to make is if you have two different workspaces and you need super high trueness or precision accuracy for each workspace, I would say you probably need two hand-eye calibrations just to handle the different workspaces. Um, but depending on your tolerances, I would say if you need like two, three millimeter range, you can probably get away with having one hand-eye calibration depending yeah. on the robot and its joint tolerances. So this is really going to be a hardware specific kind of situation and that you'll need to evaluate the abilities of not just the camera, but the hardware in your system as well. Great. Um, are there applications using RoboDK to avoid collisions and movements in real time with collaborative robots? And how is the movement of the axis of the robots restricted like safe move in ABB? Uh, I'll have to read that again. Um, yeah. <laughs> I must admit I was uh, not a good reader here. <laughs> All right. So the question is, with RoboDK, uh, is there a way to avoid collision? So uh, either automatically with path generation, if you know everything in advance, or live with an perception device like Zivit. Um, we have path planning, and we do have collisions. Uh, they are request-based at the moment, so they are not currently interactive with, let's say, a Zivia that will tell you, oh, you need to shift left and right. So that is currently uh, not possible, but we do have uh, collision detection. So if you are able to use Zivia to import your point cloud into RoboDK, you can also take the point cloud into RoboDK and see if there's possible uh, collision, how you do work around it and do uh, path planning with that. Oof, a very uh, also important question for Zivid from Mani. Uh, is this camera uh, durable for super cold weather and dusty workplace? Yeah, so our cameras are industrial grade. They're built to work across a huge amount of environments. Uh, they are calibrated from zero to 40 degrees in exterior temperature. So the interior of the camera will be warmer than that. So yes, our cameras are made to work in dirty environments. We have them placed, um, some people have some prototypes using them outdoors with like covered areas. And then we also have people using them in welding situations, um, foundries, like our cameras are made to work across the whole gamut that you can find. So yes, they are definitely durable enough. Yeah, actually, we have uh, some cases of uh, welding applications uh, where the camera is used in super tough environments, like super warm uh, temperatures and like fire everywhere and dust and smoke. And uh, uh, the camera is uh, just just another Monday in the office for the, the camera. So no problem. Um, <laughs> uh, Jose is saying, is there an award in Zivit to recognize how cute Samuel's cold background is? <laughs> yeah, those are very, very expensive for? props. Uh, what? We can send you a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. I'll, I'll wear it for sure. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm very jealous of your background. It looks very like you're going to stream some uh, video games and stuff. It's very professional. I love it. <laughs> yeah, sure. shout out to uh, to Academic and to ABB, which are very expensive props. <laughs> <laughs> we have a uh, 3D printed. Uh... <laughs> That's yeah. all we have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I won't judge you on that. It works, <laughs> technically. <laughs> no, for people who have been in our webinars before, uh, we had a very uh, mediocre background. Backgrounds is actually an upgrade what we have now. So yeah, just uh, bear with us. Next webinar, maybe we have a huge setting like uh, Samuel. <laughs> I can only hope to be that cool one day. <laughs> well, it, it, I had a webinar with a, a camera company, so I, I said I, I need to step up my game. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, Federico, do you have some examples of 2D calibration that we can download from the RoboDK website? Uh, I'll take this one. Uh, we do have examples of uh, 2D calibration using OpenCV. 
that's available on the documentation on our website. As far as Zivid, I think you also have the ability to perform 2D calibration, but as recommended before, it's always better to perform the 3D uh, calibration. But uh, on our website, you can find some examples of that using the Python API for RoboDK and the OpenCV uh, API in Python. Uh, I'll drop a link. As, yeah, Nicola was asking, uh, in order to use Zivid hardware, do you need an additional computer to make it work? Or is it possible to connect it directly to a robot? Yes, so our cameras do not connect directly to a robot. You will require a uh, interface yeah. in the middle. So an important thing to note about Zivid is we are a pure play camera. We do not do the detection side of the software. We only provide point clouds to be used to do the detection or uh, inspection. So any sort of algorithm you need to process the point cloud and understand what you're seeing in your scene is going to be on the user side. We just provide hopefully super great point clouds for you to be able to run that AI or other detection method on. Great, uh, believe it or not, we have asked, we have answered all the questions. Uh, so it was so many, I was thinking we're never gonna, we're never gonna make it guys, but we made it. Um, so that's why ask ah, yes, another question. Okay, last one from Helen. Does RoboDK have a pivot test function? Uh, it makes the robot move with all possible joints to keep the TCP staying at a fixed position and orientation. This could be used to test the TCP accuracy. Uh, yeah, we have our own test suits and uh, that provide that kind of result that will tell you how accurate your TCP is. And uh, you can also develop your own. Um, but yeah, with Ruby K, that is uh, something we offer. Yes, great. And just another point, someone asked if we can uh, simulate the Zivit captures directly from RoboDK, that, uh, for example, getting the 3D point cloud of the RoboDK simulation. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yes, it's possible, yes. So, the, uh, so we have um, pinhole camera simulations. And uh, you can also, um, so you can do RGB, grayscale, and also depth. It is not, you can also build a stereo camera using the two inputs and reconstruct that after using your favorite um, Python module. Uh, everything is, can be retrieved through the Python API or save on disk um, for processing. So you have both options. You can change the intrinsic parameters of the camera. So the resolution, the focal, uh, the, uh, FOV, everything can be uh, set in RoboDK, but it's a synthetic. So we actually are able to perform NDI calibration in the, NDI, uh, the, in the synthetic environment and see uh, in 2D uh, and see um, if we get true, true values, how accurately can we do it with nominal values. So um, yeah, it's totally possible with RoboDK. Just keep in mind if you're doing hand-eye to also really do this in the real world, because what we really take into account yeah. for is our mechan mechanical tolerances usually in the whole system. So the connection between the robot and the camera and the end effector, and just if there is any sort of tolerance in the actual mounting of the camera. So you should also redo hand-eye every time you remount your camera onto your system. If you take the camera off and you put it back on again, you have to redo your hand-eye calibration. There's always time to do maintenance on your robot. Yeah, there's very tiny, minute movements that you would ex not expect to make a huge difference in your actual calibration. Great. Uh, thank you, guys. So I think we are done with the questions. Um, so for the ones who weren't there at the beginning, uh, RoboDK uh, is offering uh, three um, uh, six months licenses uh, to random people in the audience. So I'm just going to pull a poll here that you must uh, see. Yep. Do you guys see it? Yeah. Okay. So if you are interested in winning this uh, free six months uh, license, uh, answer yes to this poll. If you're not, then just answer no or don't answer. And uh, after the webinar, um, Samuel will uh, send an email to the three winners uh pick randomly and i think you said samuel that for people who don't win you have another offer to give them yeah so if you go to the robotic website and you go on the download page you can actually download robotic and install it uh for free for 30 days so it's the it's our default uh, offer is 30 day trials it is limited but uh, you should be able to 
uh, get familiar with Ruby DK, and if it, uh, it's the right tool for you to perform your NI calibration uh, with that, the uh, three licenses that we're giving away are fully unlocked. The only thing that is not included is robot calibration, but um, you can uh, generate the code to put on your robot. You can uh, perform the NI calibration, jog your robot around with Ruby DK, vision detection, everything that's built in Ruby DK you should have access to. Um, but you are still able to try RoboDK for 30, 30 days if you don't win. Great. So it's a 30 days uh, trial, right? Correct. Good. Okay. And I'll send the link in the chat. Yes, I was about also to send it here. So you also have the, the button here that's uh, appearing. So you can just click there to uh, check the 30 days trial license, but maybe wait a day or two. If you are a winner uh, for a six months license, that might be a better, uh, <laughs> better deal. <laughs> yeah, better deal. <laughs> so maybe wait a day or two. Okay, um, I think that's it. Yes, I see there's a lot of questions if the video uh, of the webinar is gonna be available. So yes, 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 yes. Um, it's automatic, actually, uh, everything is recording uh, right now. So once we're done and when I, once I end the event, uh, it will generate uh, on-demand video that will be shared with you guys uh, automatically. So uh, no worries. And you can also share it with your friends, your colleagues, uh, your family, if you want. Uh, so no worries for that. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, do you guys have... Anything to say before we finish? No, just thank you for joining us, Sam. It was a good webinar. Yeah, thank you for uh, asking me to be there. This was great. Um, it, I love the opportunity to share our insights on robotics. So uh, see you next time. Yes. See you. Bye, guys. Goodbye, Goodbye everyone.